My guests today are Jill Brown and Susan Deacons, the co-founders of the Columbia Academy for Learning and Enrichment, shortened to the Kale School in Columbia, Missouri, that they launched in August of 2021 after years uh, as of experience as professional educators. So Jill and Susan, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. We are thrilled to be here. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. I'm thrilled to have you. I want to hear all about your founder journey, but let's start before that, before 2021. If you could each share a little bit about your background and experience in education uh, before you decided to become education entrepreneurs. So Jill, let's start with you. Okay. Um, so our background, we've been in public education for over 20 years. This would be year 25 had we stayed in public education. So um, we've done a little bit of everything. Uh, a teacher. I started out as a teacher. Um, and then I actually had a small jaunt over into the business world for just a minute. <laughs> so I worked for Edward Jones for a couple of years and and then found my way back to education, although I was training brokers there. So one could say I was still teaching. <laughs> Just different age age groups, right? Um, so came back and was a literacy coach under the National Reading First movement that was happening at that time. Um, and from there went on to do some state work, consulting work uh, around that same kind of science of reading um, work. And then decided it was probably time for me to take a leadership role instead of just teaching others how to do a leadership role. Um, and so I became a principal um, for a few years and then went into the assistant superintendentship. And then COVID hit. <laughs> and um, I knew that I wasn't going back into the same uh, world. I knew that it had shifted and I was ready to do something different. COVID was an extremely difficult time for anybody that was in that realm. And um, and it just gave me the time and reflection to say, I'm ready to do something different. Um, and so I talked to my partner into joining me in this adventure. Um, and we started that in August of 21. So it's been a great career. It really has. But to end it, um, in this way is more than I could have ever dreamed to do. I love that. All right. We'll, we'll come back then to your experience and reflections there, Jill, but Susan, let's turn to you and I'd love to hear a little bit about your background. It's very similar. Um, I actually, my first administrative job was in Kansas city at a charter school. So I spent a little bit of time in the charter world as well. Um, but the majority of my experiences in traditional public school teacher to principal, um, I moved back home to Columbia and uh, was a colleague of Jill's um, in another building. And um, then she um, told me that there was a job at central office that was open. And, and I talked to her about applying for it. And I don't know why to this day. However, I do feel like that um, the second effort on her part to do like something more um, like educational entrepreneurship together. She owed me this. She owed, she owed me this after a central office gig during COVID. So, That's fair. Um, but for, for two years, I was the K-12 executive director in the local school district in which she was serving as assistant superintendent. And that's, I mean, we were colleagues, but we, we served a very large school district here. Mm -hmm. And so we, I mean, we didn't really know each other. We weren't close. We, I mean, that was it. And that kind of changed a little bit as I worked more closely with her day in and day out in my role as executive director. And um, that's kind of where like, you know, you're in the car driving from building to building and you talk philosophy or, you know, you get to know someone's, you know, like inner, inner, inner passions, I guess. And um, that's kind of where I got to really know Jill as a professional and as, and as a person. Um, but it, it was a hard two years. And, mm -hmm. um, at the end of those two years, I, she, I'm going to just tell the story. She came to me in my office and she said, I need you to, to be the first to know that I am not going to go back next year as assistant superintendent. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I can't do this. And I said, and then she said, I, you know, if, if you're looking for a job change, you know, I think you'd be a great candidate for, for my job, which I've watched her now for two years, like 
<laughs> work herself to the bone. And I said, no, I don't No, Thank you. No, thank you. I thought you were my friend. Um, <laughs> but I don't, I don't really want your job. And furthermore, I hadn't told you this, but I'm not coming back in my job. Uh so I don't know what it's going to look like for me next year, but I can't do this anymore. And, um, we both just kind of stared at each other. Like I, it, we hadn't had that conversation. So it was very like organic, mm -hmm. like it was just in the mm -hmm. moment. And, um, it, from there it kind of, you know, you start dreaming a little bit and but it, dreams like, well, we, wouldn't it be great to do a school that was just about kids and, and the problems we solved were kids problems, right? Like we're, we're just here to support and to serve kids. And the adults are always second to the needs of the kids. And that's where our passion is. And we want to serve all kids and we want to serve kids well. And we, you know, it, it would just, and then, you know, you have a glass of wine and you talk a little bit more and then you have another <laughs> glass of wine. And then, so that's, I mean, I'm kind of blending um, probably where the direction this conversation will head next, but that's where I was and um, kind of next steps on how we, we started this adventure together. Mm -hmm. I love that. I want to go into some more detail on the startup process, including um, the preferred brands of wine that you suggest all <laughs> prospective <laughs> educational yeah. entrepreneurs consume. We have some, huh? <laughs> um, but, but backing up just a bit. So, you know, Jill, you mentioned that, you know, you had a little bit of a business stint at Edward Jones for a bit, but for the most part in education, had you ever thought about being an education entrepreneur, starting your own school, starting a small business of any sort before COVID yeah. hit? I actually was a consultant um, for quite a few years, and I still do that work. So I, um, in between, oh gosh, in between the state work and when I became a principal, I was finishing my PhD. And at that time, I could no longer work for the state agency while also being a grad assistant at the University of Missouri. So I had to kind of leap at that point. And I kept all my schools that I was consulting for. Um, and I just did it on my own. And so I had opened an LLC and kind of gotten a taste of what that was, but it was just by myself. I already had the schools. I didn't have to market. Like there was a big piece of that that was much easier than, than what we have done in, in this round. But I've always thought, gosh, if you just didn't have the barriers, what could you do? You know? And so I had enough of the taste of it. And I, I knew that it was feasible because of the work that I had done. I just wanted to do it with someone. You know, it wasn't it wasn't something that I wanted to go back and and do by myself. And and if I had, I published a book in 2019. And and I love doing my my reading work and I still do that with schools. I still consult today. And I was really just going to probably do that and open a tutoring center of my own. And had I been on my own, that's probably what I would have done. Um it was Susan's idea to like create the whole school. <laughs> so she goes, well, if we're going to do this, you know, our own children were, were young. So we actually have children that are the same age and the same grade. And so when we kept talking, it was more of a, well, why don't we start a K2 because our kids can be with us and we can grow this as, as we as we grow. Um, of course, you know, things take off a little faster than you're ready for sometimes. Um, but really that's kind of where it went from me wanting to do tutoring and consulting to Susan saying yes, to let's build a school, let's start K2 and look out now in about, in about two months. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay. that's the that's thing, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we both committed in January of 21 mm -hmm. and we were, oh, well, we had a place rented in April of 21 and we had kids in August. So, so I think though, you know, the background there, all we knew how to do was run schools. So like that part of the education part, the education part has not been the difficult mm -hmm. piece. It is the marketing and the business. And, you know, we've always just had public money. And so how to, how to build that piece, it was the business side that was the harder part, you know, to get going. Yeah, for sure. Really interesting. What about you, Susan? Had you thought about being an education entrepreneur or an entrepreneur of any kind before no. COVID? Okay. No, I mean, you know, I didn't even 
which is kind of what's so exciting, right? And so I'm, this might shock you, Carrie, but I'm not a spring chicken. I'm not like super young, right? And so I'm into this career. And when Jill and I started doing this, I will never forget, she called me and she said, there's, there's these things called micro schools. That's what we are. We're a micro school. We thought we were doing something brand new. Yeah. And it was so <laughs> exciting because like, it was like a real movement. Yeah. And it, so, you know, on one hand, we're, we've rethought how, you know, education in, in, in terms of how we want a school day to run, how would we want to serve kiddos differently? Um, those types of things. But like the whole the whole entrepreneur side of it, like that's what's been so um, exciting mm -hmm. because it's like a new career mm -hmm. in itself, right? And I mean, and there are, it, 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 like Jill said, the struggles of being a business owner. We don't have that background. I will tell you her experience at Edward Jones has been priceless, right? Mm -hmm. And so like one of the things that, and I, and I'll just say, I think, we're institutionalized in public education is your teacher retirement. What in the world? Like around us, I will say in our area, you would have to be a complete unintelligent human to walk away from your state retirement system. Like no one does that. And so for Jill to have the background and the wherewithal to say, oh, honey, they just tell you that. <laughs> it turns out you can do that and you can still retire one day. Um, things like that from, from business accounting um, practices, her background there, even though it was a small stint and who knew this would yeah, be the story right, later, right. Um, that's been huge for the business. I, I will say that um, because no question learning the business has been, that's, that's the hill we climb, you know, the education it's so much fun because this is how we wanted to do school for so long, but the business. So it's, it's kind of nice. I mean, no, I hadn't really thought about it. I didn't know. I mean, I knew there were private schools. I knew there were public schools. I knew there were charter schools. Um, but this whole notion that um, there's this movement out that, that wants to meet every single kid exactly where they are. Like I, we really, we really thought that might just be our own very <laughs> No, well, I think it's what every educator wants. To it do. is what every educator wants. To but do. you think you can't do it. That's it. And I think that's the big piece for me. And when I talk to, you know, founders who come to us, it's like getting them to believe in themselves enough to say, no, you can you really can take what you know and create this great environment that has lived in your mind probably since you entered your degree program, you know, but it probably can't play out in the current system the way you want it to. And so you have to give up some things and that's the hard part because you, they are very indoctrinated into you do a certain thing, you believe a certain thing, you handle things a certain way. And then to say, no, actually, that's just the paradigm you've been taught. You can mm -hmm. do it differently the way you want to do it. And here, let's let me let us help you. You know, mm -hmm. um, that's been exciting to help other people get started. I just love that. So you launched relatively quickly. Um just in a matter of months and we're able to establish a location really quickly. And I know usually founders say that's one of the bigger challenges, but it is that scary. Tell, <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit in that in sort of six to eight months launch period, what you, you mentioned marketing, um, some of the business components to running a small business, what sort of stands out to you during that pre-launch time as some of the biggest startup challenges? The location for sure. Like I know why we, we've been at different co micro school conferences since and uh, participated in different things. And you're right. That is what everybody says. And I know why that's what everybody says. I think number one, it's, it's scary, right? Because you, it's worrisome, like, because you have to have a place, but also like in our community, people just don't rent where kids are going to be. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like, there's a lot of office space opportunities around town, but that doesn't mean they're going to allow students in the, or children in those buildings. Mm -hmm. So, um, we happened to find a, um, chiropractor in town who had, um, he owned the whole building and the bottom of the building, which was like a walkout. So, you know, like they, they walk out onto the parking lot and there was like a cute little gazebo back there and, um, some, like some really pretty green space. Um, but it was small. It was like, it was a doctor's office and, 
he loved the idea of having kids in his building. Some of his patients were children and they were really passionate about helping us get started. And, and so that was, that was a blessing because I know why that's a stressor. And then the other thing that we have heard people share with us, we're now in a church and, and Mm -hmm. supporting local churches, um, by having someone in their building besides just on Sunday, um, has been a good business move, I would say, Mm -hmm. for a lot of churches that are hosting and supporting micro schools right now. It's not necessarily, we're, we're, we aren't affiliated with the church. We don't have any ties to the church outside of our rent payment every month. Um, But it's been a great place to grow. So, you know, when we left that original smaller space into another place where we could grow, that's been, but I I would say keeping um, always a taking time to appreciate the journey you're on because it's spectacular, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like you touch the lives of so many kiddos and the parents and like the whole reason why you got into education was to serve. And like, when you're in this journey, you get to feel that, right? Mm -hmm. And so in traditional public school settings, you, you know, the more you go in terms of that leadership, down that leadership path, the further away from those folks, Mm -hmm. further away from teachers you get, the further away from students you get, the further away from parents you get. And so to go from a central office job where I missed that so very much to come right back and just like, that's the feeling. And so you want to take time to enjoy that and embrace that and appreciate that. But I think as a business owner and being good stewards of the tuition money that, that families are, are providing for you, you also have to have the, the, the wherewithal to think now, when I hit this many children, is this, is this building going to hold me or do I need to find a different space so that it, it's, it doesn't feel like knee jerk reactions. It feels like it's thoughtful. It's been planful. Um, you start talking to parents, you know, the space is, it's fabulous. The space is fabulous. We love this for this, but I also see our kids struggling with this. We also see our kids struggling with space. We're not, and, and then they start becoming aware of it. And so then like, the whole community is looking for a next best space for you. And so I think just the space we have learned, the more open you are with people and just letting them know this is, this is kind of where we are right now. We're going to, we're going to be needing to have a change soon because we've, we've maxed out more space. Just keep your eyes out. And it is amazing to me. Parents will text, parents will email, they'll catch us at Mm -hmm. the pickup line. Oh, have you seen, have you thought about, I just saw. So I think letting people in your, in your community know that, that you're maybe looking for change and always be thinking about what next is important. I would say yeah. with the space issue. Cause that, I know your question was what's a big issue. Mm-hmm. The space issue's big. <laughs> it will always be big. <laughs> yeah. I think that, that, and, and the marketing piece, yes. that, that was the hard, I, we would stare at each other and say, we have no idea what to post one. We didn't know how to use Canva. Like I, that was not mm-hmm. our world. <laughs> Facebook so lives. we would literally just kind of stare at the screen, not knowing at all <laughs> what to post or how to say it. And as soon as we could spend some of our money to hire someone, we did. Um, and so we got some help. I would listen to podcasts. I would, you know, do research on how to do that. But we spent an exorbitant amount of time, I would say. We we might have had to have some cocktails for those too. Yeah. I'm not, I mean, since we're old friends now, Carrie, what I need to know is in order for us, those first couple of Facebook, mm-hmm. like, what are those? The, Facebook, well, we would like, do like a video, we would do a video. Right. You know? I don't know. I don't know what they're called, but you yeah. know, you put the little like phone real, up and you got to yeah. talk to mm-hmm. it, right? Yeah. You know, like you're talking to people and, you know, nobody does that except business. I mean, who? I don't do that. And it might take us three hours to shoot. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. A two minute shoot video. A two minute, maybe <laughs> video. And so then we would maybe have to have a, a, you know, a sip, a cocktail or something to help kind of to get through it, get, get through it. that. <laughs> and so I don't know where along the way something gave, but, <laughs> but yeah. now we can do those more efficiently. We but can. like Jill said, that's hard stuff because it's that was way hard. out of your comfort zone. We had no idea how to get got to get yeah. people. And I think we were lucky because we were educators in our town. We did, people knew who we were. And so I think that helped us for sure to get some of those early families. And, you know, everyone says, how do you grow? And the truth that you don't want to hear yes. is that it's word of mouth and referral. <laughs> and no one wants to hear that. And it's really hard to hear when you first start out because you think this is going to take so long. And 
It does take, I mean, we started with 10 kids, mm -hmm. seven of which were paying, you know, the other three were ours or another lady that helped us get started. And, you know, so we didn't pay ourselves for months and, you know, so planning for those things, planning the business side of it and the location, I think those were the three biggest for sure. pieces when we first got started. So you opened in August of 2021 with 10 kids. Mm -hmm. Um, and including some of your own. Yeah. <laughs> um, and tell us about that first year. What was that like? It was the best, it best. Was the best year. <laughs> the best. And we weren't making any money and we didn't know how we were going to sustain, but it was the best year. And looking back on it, like the kids loved that first space. They still talk about it. They remember it. Um, it was just very quaint and it was very collaborative. Um, and you knew each other very well. It oh, was yeah. definitely a little family. Um, by by December of that year, we had 17, mm -hmm. 19, something like that. And that's when we had to move. So we actually were only in that office space for, well, we rented in April and started in August. So from August to December, um, we had to move. And that was hard to give up really that hard. little space, but we were literally stepping on each other. And so when we moved over to um, the church, then that allowed us to grow to 45, I think, by the end of year two. By the end of? The second year. The second year. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so now we'll, we're going into our fourth year and we're starting with 85 and we have added nine through 12 for the upcoming year. So, yeah. Yes. So, so the word of mouth is working then, right? Yeah. People are yeah. hearing what you're doing and wanting to be a part of it. Yeah. Um, Susan, maybe you can talk a little bit about the Kale School. Tell us about the model. What? How does it run? Well, so we consider ourselves a whole child approach to learning, um, which in a nutshell means we're going to have high expectations for kids. We're going to support them in doing um hard things. <laughs> um, so we'll provide the structure, but we want them to know what working hard and feeling good about the work you produce feels like. Um, we also support the social emotional needs of kids. And I will just tell you as, as long as we've been educators, there's, I, I never remember a time where that is more important for kids. Um, and so the academic piece is important. It's high, you know, high levels of, of expectations there. But then scaffolding that and also supporting through the social emotional um, needs of children is kind of in, in a nutshell, that's the whole child approach. I, I So decisions are made there, right? So like what's best for kids? And sometimes that means we change a whole school schedule because we have six first graders that need a next level in math. And right now they can't access that math teacher because that's where the schedule is. So um, we do multi-age, we, we serve kids where their next best need is. And so our kids move. So if a student has dyslexia, they might, great, that's fine. We, Jill has that extensive background to plan um, and be very programmatic and thoughtful in how we're going to help those students move along or any student with complex reading needs. Um but all our kids are moving, right? So like we assess them all not to see whether or not they can get in. We take all kids. That doesn't matter to us. Um, we believe in what we're doing and we believe um, that, that we can support kids um, academically. So that's what we want to do. Um, we put them in groups and smaller groups um, and they move. They move throughout, um, especially the core subject areas, reading, writing, math, Um and we teach small groups of kids all morning long and they move to different adults. Um, it's important for us that we hire um, teachers with a lot high capacity, right? So like they all have master's degrees. Um, we're both doctorate level educators, a um, couple of specialists. So they have to be really good. Our, ma our, our math teacher, she's a doctor level a uh, math teacher. She's taught all the way through college. She's taught young teachers how to be math teachers. And our goal in doing that is to never, um, from a structure 
a place of structure, put a glass ceiling on kids, right? So I'll, I'll give you an example. So we have a um, student who's going to be an eighth grader this year. And he's a brilliant mathematician. He's brilliant. And I told Jill, I taught math our first year when we had all the 10 kids. And I guess he'll be a seventh grader. And he was in fourth grade. And I said, I can teach this kiddo for one year. After that, we're not doing right by him. We're not doing right by his family if we don't get another math mind in here because he is way beyond what I can do. And um, so that's what we did. And that teacher had taught all the way through calculus and high school math. And so there was nothing that this child was going to encounter that she couldn't explain and not just explain one way, but explain multiple ways. And so she retires at the end of this year. Then we hire the one I was just telling you about, another PhD level math teacher. She's taught through college. And so she's passionate about her her curriculum, right? She's passionate about the math, but she's also student focused. Mm -hmm. And that's what is so important to us. Like we're not trying to raise little like robots, like all third graders are different. All fourth graders are different. And our goal is not to start at the beginning of a third grade curriculum and get to the finish line of the third grade curriculum that like, that's, that's not life. And that's not our goal. And that's traditional school, in my opinion. Our goal is to take a kid, whether they have a next best need because they're struggling in an area or they need a next best need for enrichment, it doesn't matter to us. Do we have the adults in the building to support every one of those levels of kiddos? And that to me is where we are very particular on who we hire and who's coming in so that I can take my young mathematician and I mean, he'll be doing algebra this year and I make sure that I, I don't care it, what if it's seventh grade math or not is is irrelevant to me am i serving him well by being able to provide him access to curriculum that's going to push him motivated and keep his passion for math because that feeds that kid's soul right now so who are we to squash that and i so i think those are the things um the reading and i'll let jill talk about that i the whole child approach that multi age moving kids to where they need to be for their next regardless of age regardless of grade those are just numbers um but then i would say the other non negotiable is the science of reading and that's all jill and and i'll let her talk about that because it's that's ex absolutely who we are to the core yeah i mean it, it's the same same thing she's saying we just we don't really we make sure that kids can read we make sure they have basic foundational math once they get beyond those kinds of things they can do anything you know mm -hmm. so um so i think we're we're moving a couple different directions this year which i think is exciting so for the 9 12 we're not opening at all traditionally um actually what we're doing is i don't think anybody else around us is doing anything like this so our kids will be um dual enrolled actually. They will still be within the public school system and or, well, I should say or, um, they will enroll through an online um, public like virtual school. So they'll get all of their accreditation and their courses through one of those two avenues. If they enroll through our traditional public school system, um, then they still have access to a lot of the things that the public school kids will have. So they can still do career you know, career ed and um, sports and all those kinds of things, but they will never really step foot in the building unless they want to. Their day will be spent with us. And so the we were able to hire a, an administrator, a high school administrator to take over this programming. And so what it's going to look like is completely individualized high schools, um, which is I think a lot of micro schools are going in kind of this direction. It's just very new here. Um, so while they get their coursework and he'll help them through their coursework, he's building the individualized plan that allows them to do anything else they want to do. So if they want to get a micro credential in graphic design, they can go do that. If they want to do an internship somewhere, he'll help them set that up. If they want to do a trip somewhere, they'll do the trip. And so it's letting them control their coursework in the uh, speed in which they need to do it. And then really a guide or a coach all along the way to say, yes, but what else do you want to do during these four years? So what a counselor, I think, probably wants to do at a school, but they have 500 kids. <laughs> and so like, you're never going to be able to do that. And so to have that personalized high school 
is really exciting for us um, twofold. One, it, it's just different and it gives kids a very different path. They don't have to be on their own. If they choose online high school and do it at home, I think that's hard for a lot of kids. And so to be able to do that and have a place to go and have the socialization and have all of that support is unique. Um, but two, we also know that we have been very fortunate in finding teachers because we let them retire and then we snag them over. <laughs> Um, or they are, they don't want to do public ed anymore and they come over, but we also know that the pipeline for teachers is drying <laughs> quickly. And so to stay ahead of that, um, and to get into an online model where you have access to fa fantastic teachers across the U S and beyond, um, that feels like the right way to go instead of doing something more traditional, you know, so it's just fascinating. I love um, that you're trying to think of ways of kind of partnering with public schools. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about how this works for students that are enrolling through a district. It sounds like they're enrolling through a district online school. Mm -hmm. And then what is the financial model for that? Because are they then also paying out of pocket mm -hmm. to attend your program? How is that working? Yeah. So that will, it will be a free model through their coursework. And so essentially they're paying to do their coursework here and get all the support. So rather than hiring a tutor, perhaps, you know, to have your kid get help with some online coursework, they're, they're able to be in a brick and mortar building that provides them that structure and individualizes according to what they want to do, which is something totally different, you know? And so we kind of, it's like online plus, I guess, mm, Yeah, you yeah. know, and, and if they want to do a traditional four year, then Matt will help them get on that traditional four year track where they do the ACT prep and they, they do the letters and they've got the service hours under their belt and he's introducing them to people through internships. So like they can do that or they can say, this is probably not for me when I go out of high school. And by the way, I'd like to get done in two years instead of four years, um, I can go on this more um, vocational track and I can make sure that I come out with what I need to be able to go into the workforce if I want to do that. So I think it's just really personalizing. Yeah. And we have our own curriculum that will like a, yeah. align with that. That is all around like the executive functioning skills, the, um, the building of a professional, the time management, well, executive functioning, um, but the collaboration, the cooperation. So, so doing, um, projects, doing seminars, um, those are things that are, um, life-changing for kids, you know, and that, that social, that, that need to build the social emotional support in, in young students is not changing when they get to high school. Like that's just the, the trajectory right. that we've seen. It's not, it only ramps up in middle mm -hmm. school and again in high school. And so, um, kids need to feel supported. They need to feel cared about. They need to know who to go to. Um, self-advocating is a tremendous skill in terms of long-term success, post post second post secondary life, whether it's college or not, but the ability to self advocate is something that a lot of kids struggle with, and we need to be intentional about building that. So it's like it's the stuff that the state of Missouri says you have to have is all online, but what parents are paying for, like Jill said, is to make sure that there is a coach, there is a support, there is guidance, there is the social emotional needs being met by, you know, the director of the program or an actual counselor, but there's also all the life skills mm -hmm. that have to be developed. It like with intentionality, like those aren't going to happen by accident, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so how do we build these super competent, super confident graduates when they leave us, I think is, is the big charge that we feel for that high school. So your yeah. pre your pre K uh, now it will soon be through twelve, um, and I'm curious what you're hearing from parents mm -hmm. who have joined the school over the past four years, or uh, I guess three years at this point, or in your in your finishing your fourth year. Is that what it is? No, finishing third. Finishing going your third. You're going yeah. into your fourth, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, what are you hearing from these parents? Are they parents who? had their children enrolled in a conventional school and then there was some sort of pain point that led them to think about alternatives or are they parents who out of the gate were choosing a different kind of educational model either as homeschoolers or potentially 
um, before school age, you know, choosing not to enroll their child in a pre-K or kindergarten program in a conventional school? What's that mix like and why are people coming to you? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, if you're talking about our primary grades, it's, it's different <laughs> yeah. depending on the age level of the students. So mm-hmm. our primary students, these are parents that um, probably before they had children would have said that um, our kids were going to go to public schools. Things have changed. They want something smaller. They want something more intimate. Um, they want relationships, stronger relationships that it's just hard for our colleagues in big public schools to provide. To, to no one's fault. Um, so I would say that's our primary academy, right? Like those families kind of fit in there. And what um, what co- what prompted them to change? What what do you think happened from thinking, but maybe before they had kids that they would do public schools and then changing? I mean, I think COVID changed a lot of things for people. Our own system has gone through a lot of political issues. And I think that is a lot of it. There was a lot of, when we left um, the district, a lot of people were leaving. And so there's been a lot of overturn and it's just, it has not been, it has been very difficult, I think, for them to get back to on their feet Mm -hmm. um, since COVID has happened. And they're just keep, there continues to be things that come up that are causing problems. I mean, they can't find teachers, right? Um, there are political issues happening. The town is very divided on several things. And I think it's just a combination of all of those things, large class sizes, sometimes up to 30. Mm-hmm. And parents are just like, you know what? We don't have to do that. And so I think they're just starting to look for something yeah. different, almost like they've been given permission yes. because mm-hmm. they did they they did it for a year. <laughs> and, and I think that's where where we also saw the need for the high school piece was that there was nothing in between either you're in seat or you're online, but there was nothing that kind of met the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think people were looking for that in the older kids. And I think the younger kids are just saying, we don't have to do this. Yeah. different. And I would say our older elementary middle school, those are more pain points, right? So those are kids that, um, went back to public school after mm-hmm. COVID that were not successful. Um, they, the anxiety of especially young boys right now is mind blowing to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in our community, our, our middle school and, and elementary, they're huge, mm-hmm. they're huge. And so um, that the social emotional piece and I, and I, and these are great kids. I'm going to be very fair to these kids. I mean, they're, they're, these are fabulous kids from fabulous families, but some kids, 600, 800 kids is too many in a building for me. Like that's just too much for me to navigate. And, um, those middle school, upper elementary years are hard anyway, in terms of self-esteem and just adolescence and stuff. <laughs> and so I would say from that, that group, of students, it's pain points around lack of academic success that parents feel feel like their children should be achieving, or the social emotional needs have become um, to a point where parents really want their kids to feel loved, to feel valued, Mm -hmm. to be a a bigger part of the community. To like school again. To like school again. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. Mm -hmm. So you have these plans now for this high school. As you think ahead to, say, the next four or five years, um, what do you see happening? What's sort of your vision for the future of the Kale School? Yeah, it's a great question. We're actually working through this right now. That's why we're <laughs> laughing. Um, we know we're out of space where we are. So we're back into the uh, location question mark. Um, and we might, we might have a space, um, that is ready to go. We, we want it to be the right space. And so we're, we're pickier this time, I think about where we land next. Um, but those, those questions we, we, well, we say every time we have said, we're going to cap at a certain number, it, it, it extends because we have the complete inability to tell a parent, no, we can't take their child, especially when they seem so desperate to, to need something different. We just, we can't tell a kid no. And so we continue to grow. Um, but we're now saying 100, 100 is our cap. And so we can't get 15 more people into where we are right now. We know that. Um, and so that is on our horizon. Yeah. 
Um, we also have a, a second business that we that we run, um, Kale Education and Company, and it's kind of like a, a sister company that um, still does consulting work um, and some tutoring work, but we really want to get into the field of helping other micro school people. And so we are completely changing that website around um, to target micro school founders. It's not there are some in Missouri, um, but we would love to become a hub where we can do some more work yeah. at that higher level to help other people just, I don't know, take the leap, <laughs> take the leap and help kids. Um, and so it's that's another big one. community. Yeah, it it's just the it micro is, school community yes. is just on. It's like unlike any other professional yeah. experience I've had. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It, it's all so welcoming. And it, for us, we see it every time we go to a conference, like public school conferences aren't like micro school conferences. It's more of like, a, here's what you have to do. Here's a top down. Make sure you do this. Don't you dare do that. And that's not at all what the micro schooling community is like. It's like, great, what do you want to do? We'll help you get there. And I remember the first one we went to, we looked at each other and we were like, no one's ever said that to us as educators. <laughs> like that has never been. And, and to deprogram ourselves out of that has been really difficult. That's true. Because There's, we don't yeah. have the, we've never had the permission to do things differently. Um, and so, you know, helping other educators that have been in another, like in the public field or, or doing something different, you know, helping them make that leap is important to us. And so, um, we're hoping to grow that side too. That's exciting for us. Yeah. I love that. You've said a couple of things, the sort of overlapping themes here, uh, Jill, you said sort of, um, you have permission to do things now that you as educators probably always felt were the right things to do. And then earlier, um, you were both talking about parents having permission now to look at alternatives too. So it's sort of teachers and parents Absolutely. being given the permission to explore different kinds of uh, educational models and look at more personalized, joyful education yeah. spaces. Um, you know, do you see that momentum continuing? I do. I I, mean, I, I really think that this is, it is the exact perfect storm of what's happening, I think, in the educational landscape. It's been happening for a long time. I think COVID did a couple of things. Um, it taught our teachers free of charge how to do things online. And so they all of a sudden were open to a whole new world um, of how to access children and help children. Um, so I think that they kind of got that taste of, oh, I could do something a little bit different. Um, and I think there's just been such a storm within public education that frankly is not going to get better. I, I really don't see that changing. Um, there's too many issues. There's too many barriers. There's not enough teachers. The, the pay and the benefits are not, the retirement system is not going to keep these young teachers in the profession. It's not, they don't, they don't even think like that, you know, it's just a different generation of people, I think. Um, and so I don't see, I was listening to a podcast and I always go back to it because it was a, um, oh, Luca Perry's work. It was, he, he had a, a someone on and he said, some of us have decided that we're just going to work system adjacent because we can't root for the public the public school system to completely fail, but we know it's failing. And mm -hmm. so while we continue to try to help our colleagues there the best we can, we also are going to work system adjacent to help the kids that it just can't help. And I thought that's what we're doing, you know, and I think I do think it's the future of education. I mean, when I think about what people could be doing, I, we know there's a better way and we know the current system doesn't work. And so I believe that more and more educators are going to say, forget it. I'm a professional. I'll just go do this myself mm -hmm. <laughs> and we'll do it the right way. And I don't, I, you know, I do worry in the back of my head about legislation and how will they try to keep those things down? And I know different states deal with different things mm -hmm. on that. We're slow. Missouri is very slow <laughs> to do things. <laughs> we're not so, leading the charge <laughs> per se. So we're fortunate, you know, here to be able to just say you're opening private and, and start doing the work. Um, so I think it'll be interesting. I do. But I think the micro school movement is real. I do. And I think the more we can support each other, um, the grassroots effort of that is amazing. Yeah. 
So it is amazing. And you're very much a part of that, not only in uh, building the successful kale school, which is um, getting to the point of no longer necessarily being so micro (laughs) because you have so much demand, but then also as part of that, helping to activate other education entrepreneurs to benefit from your knowledge and your support Mm -hmm. through your consulting practice. So if my listeners and viewers want to learn more about both the kale school and follow your progress there, as well as the services you offer to help support Mm -hmm. prospective education entrepreneurs, what is the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, we have two email or well, we have two websites. So we have one website that was our original. So it always is just the school, um, which is www.comocale.com. So that is all about the school and there's ways to contact us on that. And then the Kale Education and Company website is www.kaleedco, C-A-L-E, edco.com. And that is the one that we're going to retweak and and make more micro school friendly. So you can definitely watch for that um, as we're coming up, but we love to talk to people and we love to help. So we, we welcome anyone to reach out and get some support. Amazing. Well, now the most important question as we wrap up, are we talking about Chardonnay, Cabernet, Red, white, what is, uh, what's your go-to suggestion for aspiring reds. founders? Reds. She's reds. She's a red. Yeah. I'm a red, I'm a red kind of gal. Cause you got it. You know, you have to, pon- you have to kind of ponder over things for a while. It's, it's warm when you pour it. So you don't have to rush through anything. Right. And, and the bottle stays, it's just the way it's supposed to be. I mean, you're going to be here a while when you're planning stuff. So uh, you're, you're going to want the wine to stick with you. So to me, the red, red is the way to go. I will drink red with her. I probably prefer Savion Blanc. That's usually <laughs> my go-to, but um, you know, wine's wine, right? And, and Carrie, since this, since this adventure started, who are we fooling? We've gone straight over to the old fashions. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> now we're talking, Carrie. <laughs> Well, now we know the real secret to success of uh, education (laughs) entrepreneurship. So just amazing. Well, I'm so happy to talk with you and thrilled to be able to watch your progress and the other lives you touch through your consulting work. So Susan Deakins and Jill Brown, thank you so much for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thank you for having us.